happening around here at Life Point. I want to tell you about another thing that's going to be happening soon. Uh, in your chair this morning, hopefully you saw one of these little cards. If not, you're sitting on it, just FYI. And you probably destroyed it, but that's we got plenty more, so it's all good. Um, in two weeks from today, we're starting a brand new series called Better Together. Um, it's a relationship series, not just for, for marriages, but for single folks as well. Um, and was, I think it's going to be very helpful. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of fun. We always have a lot of fun with these relationship series. We're going to talk about stuff we wouldn't normally talk about at church, which is also kind of fun uh, uh, as well. And these cards are just for you maybe to uh, invite somebody uh, that you know, a neighbor, a coworker, a friend, whatever the case. Not because they need it, just because maybe they're interested. And uh, so take a second and uh, take one of those with you. There's some more out in the lobby as well. And you can grab a handful if you like and just pass those out. We'd appreciate it. And I think it'll be a blessing to you as well. Um, we're in this series called uh, The Power of Same. And the idea is that we're talking about doing the same right things over and over and over again. Instead of looking at the new, at the, in the, the beginning of a year, at all the latest, greatest gadgets and this and that and the other, that sometimes what we're already doing, if we just did it more consistently, has incredible power to change our lives. And so that's what we've been talking about. And we've been basing it off of Jesus' teachings. And John chapter 15 to his uh, disciples. Um, he's just had the upper room experience that we that we just talked about. And we celebrated the, the Last Supper. Um, and the Bible says they got it from there. And they went to the Mount of Olives. Um, and probably walking through a vineyard. Um, he began to look at these vines and these branches and these grapes. As this metaphor that he could t give these last uh, words to um, his followers before, before he's crucified. And so these last words carry a tremendous amount of weight. And so we've been teaching from these words for the last uh, four weeks. And so today I want to pick up in verse 4 of John 15. I um, mean, you can look at it with me on the screen or in your notes. Uh, if you can have your Bibles, you can turn there as well. Jesus says to his fellows, remain in me. The old translations say, abide in me. And I love that, abide in me. As I also remain in you. And then he says, no branch. And remember, you and I, we're, we're the branches here. He says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain or stay connected to, draw its strength from. The vine has to be its source, in other words. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. And then verse 16, he says, you, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. And this is, the, this is the phrase that we want to talk from today. That bear fruit. Fruit that will, would you say it with me? Last. That's the, we don't want to be one hit wonders. Flash in the pan. We want to, we want to know how to sustain and, and to be successful in the way that Jesus is teaching here. We want, to, we want to know how to do it over the long haul. And he says, and then so that whatever you ask in my name. Father will give you. So today we want to talk to you on this idea, the secret of sustainable success. Thank you so much for being here today. I, I want to give you the big idea um, this morning right out of the gates. I don't want you to have to wait for it. And here it is, right? Your success is only as sustainable as its source. Right? Think about that. Your success in whatever area of life that you're looking to succeed in is only as sustainable as its source. So if you're succeeding in some area of your life, it's, it's the wise per person says, why am I succeeding in this, in this, in this area? And then, and then what is the source of this success? Where is this coming from? Because your success is only as sustainable as its source. And this is the, t this is what... Jesus, this is his point that he's trying to make um, in the statements that he's been laying out to his disciples in this passage that we've been studying for the past month, right? He, he's saying, listen, no fruit can be greater or better than the vine that produced it. This is, this is just true, and it's, it's true in agriculture, but it's, it's true in our lives. And he's talking about sustainable living. You know, sustainable is a, is a trendy word right now, right? Everybody's looking for sustainable energy sources and sustainable farming techniques and sustainable fisheries and sustainable lifestyles. And Jesus, of course, always ahead of his time, is talking about sustainable living, right? How to have sustainable faith, faith that lasts, 
sustainable spirituality and sustainable success. I'm saying a lot of S's this morning. It's a good thing I don't have a lisp today or I'll be like spitting all over all of you. And I'm spitting right now. I can see it on my own screen. You're welcome for that uh, little idea for you there. Um, lasting success in life. First of all, let me just stop. How many of you, just, just curious, you actually want that? You want lasting success in your life, right? right? Some of you didn't raise your hand. That's fine, right? The rest of us were like, yes, we want that, right? Um, sustainable, it, it, it depends on its roots um, to support it and to sustain it. So, so you, you show me someone in life who is having a meteoric rise, a successful thing, and they, they haven't put down any roots to sustain that. I will show you somebody who is probably on shaky ground. And, and we've all seen this with very talented, very gifted people, very political people, very famous people who, who, who rise fast, but then they fall hard because they weren't rooted. And, and generally what that means is that their, their talent, their abilities took them someplace that their character could not sustain. This has happened over and over again. You see this in, even in marriages sometimes where some guy is super good looking or whatever. He's got like a six pack or a 12 pack or whatever pack you can have. He's got a lot of swag and he, and he, reel, he reels in the, this woman. And then after a little while they get married and then she starts to notice that just his looks aren't glossing over the lack of character that he has. And then the marriage gets in trouble quick because the source has to be good for lasting success. And this is why Jesus kept harping in this, in this whole passage of John 15 on the idea of just staying connected and, and remaining in him. The, the power of saying, the power of, of consistency, the power of doing the right things over and over and over for a long period of time. He's telling us, guys, I've got to be your source. Guys, I'm about to leave. I'm about to be gone, and I've got to be, you got to be connected to me if you want to succeed over the long haul in your lives. Success is only as sustainable as its source, right? If our success in any area of life is flowing from the wrong source, it will always be short lived. Some of you, if you were honest, you would say, you know what, Dad, that's true, man. I've seen that in my own life. And this is what Jesus is saying. Like you got to be anchored to something. What, what are you anchored to and what are you tethered to? And he's saying to the guys, listen, you want to lead, lead a successful life? Then I want you to ride my coattails. Like hang on to me. I'm going to take you somewhere. But, but, but conversely, he says, listen, you decide not to and do things on your own. It's not going to end up well. He says that over and again. So it's a no-brainer, right? Connect yourself to a source that is good, that matters. And he says, you will be fruitful. You will bear fruit. Now, now, I want you to think about this because sometimes in life, our source um, is what other people think about us. Like we, we derive our sense of self-worth, our sense of well-being from what other people think about us. But what other people, what other people, uh, people's opinions are, are fickle, man, right? And they don't, they're, not, they're not sustainable because if their opinions change you, right? Then, 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 then all of a sudden, your, your self-worth, your opinion of yourself goes away. We, we, we all see this in pop culture where somebody's the latest, greatest for like five minutes and then you never hear from them again. I'm talking to you, handsome. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right? Google that. Google Hanson, right? So, so Jesus says, I am the true vine. And I think that by saying, he could have just said, I'm the vine. But he says, I'm the true vine. And I think he says true vine because if there's a true vine, then it stands to reason that there's a, there's a false vine or a fake vine. A, a vine that for a season could bear some kind of fruit, but has nothing to sustain it. And, 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 and if there's a fake vine, then it can produce fruit for a stretch, but it's not fruit that will remain. And here's the, here's the thing, and, and I want you to really hear what I'm saying. We, we can fool ourselves sometimes in life. By thinking because this thing, this part of our life is going well, that God must be in fact blessing what this is. But let me tell you something. If what we're doing that we think is successful, the thing that we think God is blessing is not Christ honoring, is not a, a, a value that Christ teaches us, then it is not, it is not being blessed by God. It is connected to a false fruit and it will, it will falter and it will fail. It's just a fact. It's not connected to him at all if it doesn't honor him in some way. So, so ask yourself. It is my flow in life. 
Is it coming from the true vine or is it potentially coming from a source that is false? That is not going to lead me in the best way because Jesus says, apart from me, you, you can do nothing. You connect yourself to the true vine, you'll, you'll flourish over the long haul. You'll have ups and downs. It won't be perfect, but over the long haul, you'll look at life and see that it was a series of fruit bearing type things. You know, I, I've seen people who've had a meteoric rise for a short season. They're good in verse, but they cannot sustain it over the long haul. I've seen these people because I look at one of them in the mirror daily. Come on, somebody. Right? I've been that guy, like, where at the beginning of the year, I eat, like, grass and seeds, and then I work out like a beast, and I get fit, as fit as I'm capable of being, right? Um, but, but I can't sustain it. Come on, don't act like I'm the only one. Come on, how many of you know what I'm saying? By the third day of this year, you were back to nailing whatever you could find in the pantry. I, it's not just me, couch sitters, right? Your couch has a perfect indention of your posterior in it. It's not just mine. Get out of my posterior spot, you know what I'm saying? Posterior, I haven't said that ever, maybe. It's more appropriate than other things that I was thinking. Anyways, right here we're going, moving on. Right? But this is why you have to examine your motives. Like, why am I doing this? If the source of your success is your own strength, strength fails. Right? If the source is your own intelligence, the world's too complicated for that. Come on, somebody, right? If the source is your own skill and ability, skills erode with time. Ask Kobe Bryant. Come on, somebody. That's a Spurs fan in the house today. We love Kobe, kind of. Right? If the source is your carefully constructed image and not your integrity, then you're in trouble and you just don't know it yet. In life, we need a flow. We need life to flow from something that is constant. Right? Would you say that word with me? Say, say constant. Right? Like, I, don't, I know very little about math. I've told you that over and over again. But I, I Googled this. And a constant in, in, as a mathematical thing is, 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 a, is a part of algebra. And, and here's what it means. It means a fixed value that does not change. Right? Nothing's going to change this va the value of this thing. That there are no variables that will affect something that is a constant. So the secret of sustainable success is being anchored to things in life that produce good things. That are constant in your life that produce. They don't change. No matter which way the tides of culture shift. And they shift constantly. No matter what popular opinion says or what the media says or what this person says. There are some things in life that simply don't change. They are constant. And so we see them and we recognize them. We recognize their value and we anchor ourselves to them. So having said that, let me ask you again. What, what is the sources in your life? What are the constants in your life? What are the, the sort of bedrock principles that you're living your life by? <laughs> Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever maybe made a list of the things that are, that are so critical, their core values for you? They don't change. And I want to spend the rest of our time talking about that and hopefully having you ask yourself that. Like, what, what, is, what is the source of my success in, my, in, in areas of my life? Because the source of your success is only a sustainable um, are the, 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 your success is only as sustainable as its source. What's the source? What's the, what's the constant? And, and what I want to do is I want to look at a passage in Romans, the book of Romans, um, which is um, one of the most profound books in all of the Bible. And the, the author is Paul, and he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I want to read it to you from a translation called The Message. And so maybe if you're ever looking in through your Bible app, you see MSG. That's not like what they put in Chinese food. I mean, that is what they put in Chinese food. But it's also something called The Message. Come on, somebody. Monosodium, sodium glutamate or glutamate or something ate. You know what I'm saying? Don't ate it, though. It's not good for you. Take it out. Um, MSG. Back to whatever I was talking about. I completely forgot. Because like, I've been eating grass and seeds for 21 days, and Chinese food sounds awesome right now. Can I get a witness on that? Come on. Take me, to, take me to P.F. Chang's right now. Man, I would just... It's over today, baby. 21 days. Some of you are guests today, and you're like, what the heck is that guy talking about? Google Daniel Fast, and you'll know what's been happening right here. I'm gaunt. 
I'm practically a waif, you see. <laughs> why, why are y'all laughing at me? Right now? I'm not a waif? Come on. I'll eat a wafer. I just did. I dropped it on the ground and put it in my mouth. It was, really, it was super dry. I had to go get a drink and soon it was over with. That little tiny thing dried me out like that. Anybody else like, um, okay, I'm just going to move along. Right <laughs> Romans 15. Paul's writing about community. And he's saying these incredible things like, if you're strong, those of you who are strong, I want you to find people who are weak and I want you to lift them up. And he's saying, listen, I want you to, I want you to look at your, the neighbors, the, the interests of your neighbors, not just your next neighbors, but the people in your life. I want you to consider them above yourself sometimes. I want you to think about them. How can I help them? How can I build them up? How can I strengthen them? Not just, not just yourself. This is what he's saying in, in, in Romans 15. And, and when, I, when I was reading this, I was thinking about the life groups that we are forming right now that next week we're going to be launching. There are going to be tents out there. My wife described that to you a little while ago. But he, he's saying, hey, guys, I want you to gather in groups and have community where you're not just looking out for your own interests. You're saying, God, bless me. Give me Give me provision, but not just so I can have it for myself, but so I can be a blessing to, to others as well. And this is what he's saying. He's talking about mature Christianity. And he says in Romans 15 verse 4, even if it was written in Scripture long ago, you, you can be sure it's written for us. And, and, and this is a constant. This, the, the Word of God is a constant. And, and what I love about it is, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but you can write something with one intention and somebody can read it in a completely different intention. You ever had this where somebody got ticked off at you for an email you sent? You thought, what in the world? You're like, go back and read it again. Read it to your wife. Read it to your cat. Did you get offended by this? Why do they get offended by this? Is it just me that offends people on a regular basis with my emails? I have to send them all to my wife. That's offensive, Danny. Don't say it like that, right? Um, not really. Um, but, but there's this idea that we read it one way and, and, and somebody else can read it another way. And the beautiful thing about the Bible is it's a letter. And it's very personal, meaning that I can read it. Even though it was written ages ago, I can read it and, and find that it's relevant, that it's true, that yes, the world changes. And, and yes, there are complexity, but that his word endures forever, that it is relevant today just as, was, as, as much as it was back when it was written. And it's been through fires and trials and, and, and people have tried to snuff it out, but it remains. And, and that app that maybe, many of you have on your Bible, over 200 mil, million million people around the globe have downloaded the power of, of the word of God right onto their phones and, and it's a powerful thing because Jesus Christ said he was the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen, somebody? Amen. And, and so he says, and, and, and even if it was written in scripture long ago, you can be sure it's written for us. God wants the combination of his, what? His steady. Now before we just run past this word steady, Steady gets a bad rap, especially relationally. If you're dating somebody and people are like, yeah, he's kind of steady. Like that, that means boring, right? <laughs> or like he's kind of old or, or whatever. Like he's steady. But those of you who've been with somebody who's not steady, right? Come on, right? Some people will say, some of your friends will go, dude, that chick is nuts. And what they mean is she's not steady. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you ever dated somebody who was crazy? You appreciate steady. Can I, steady is even sexy in a way. Can I get... No, no, man. Six pack is... is sec, no, no. Six pack ain't sustainable. Come on, somebody. I don't, you can brag about it now, but wait till you get 44. You, you're not going to have... You have like a 12 pack of donuts wrapped around that situation. All up in there. Steady's good, man. It's dependable. You ever been with somebody who's undependable? You'll know steady matters. And... And, stay. and then the next word he says is, is constant. That's a beautiful word there. And, and then he lists three things in the rest of this text that I want to highlight this morning that I think are important to lasting success. And I'm going to read them to you. And he, and he says, his steady, constant calling and warm personal counsel in Scripture is going to come to characterize Keeping us alert for whatever he will do next. See, it's important that you have some constants in your life because it keeps you alert for what's coming next. Because sometimes stuff happens that we weren't ready for, that we weren't rooted and grounded for, and it knocks us down. It knocks us over. It blows us off. We lose faith. We get, we get so freaked out, and we, we panic, and we make bad decisions because we weren't rooted, and we weren't ready for what was coming next. And then he says, may our dependably steady and Warmly personal God. Develop maturity in you so that you get along with each other 
as well as Jesus gets along with us all, and then we'll be a choir. Not our voices only, but our very lives singing in harmony in a stunning anthem to the God and Father of our Master Jesus. Steady, constant, dependable. These are words that Paul is using to describe God. Like, and, and if you want to be a one-hit wonder, then, then you can ignore this text and be like the Backstreet Boys. Come on, somebody, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and if you want to be like the Rolling Stones, anybody Rolling Stones fans in the house today? One guy, one guy. You two? Better? Okay. I, I'm, trying, I'm just trying to work with you guys today. You see what I'm saying? If you want to be like this, you pay attention. His, his, his constant call, and that's what I want to talk about first. What, what I mean by that is that every one of us who are, who are following Christ have a calling from God on our lives um, to be something. Call, calling in, in, in sort of religious ways, often we think of that as for, it's reserved for people like, you know, famous people, you know, Billy Graham or Mother Teresa, like, oh, they're called, but the rest of us, we're just called to follow whatever they say or whatever they do. No, no, no. Everybody has a calling by God. Every person who's a believer has a calling um, from God on their lives. And, and you can't just define that calling by what, what, are you, what you're doing or what's going on in your world right now. Because, because if you base it on your circumstances, circumstances change. Life changes. Sometimes we do the right thing. Sometimes we do the wrong thing. And so we think, well, I did some wrong stuff for a season there. So now I'm out. I don't have a calling. No, no, no. That's not how it works. I, I want to give you a perfect. For instance, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, there's a story about a guy named David. Young boy, he's a shepherd boy, and, 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 and he's living out a calling that God had given him really from the time he was born. And it was a calling that had him, uh, as he's protecting his father's flock, it, it has him killing a lion that had come to eat the, 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 the sheep, and, and then later on a bear. And then, and then now in this passage, he's facing uh, a, a giant named Goliath who has come to defy God and, and the people uh, of Israel. And, and, and he's never faced a giant before. He's, he's faced a bear, he's faced a lion, maybe some other animals, and boredom, whatever. But he's, this is a variable that he's not familiar with. But the same calling that helped him defeat the bear and the lion is now going to step up into his life. Circumstances changed all along his way. And, and you read in David's story, sometimes he even sinned. Sometimes he did really bad things, but his calling never changed. David knew his calling was the same. And he had the same God who had delivered him before. And he says, the same God who delivered me before will deliver me again, will deliver you into my hands. And this is this idea that, that he understands I'm called. Like th those of you who are parents, I, I need you to know if you don't that you were called by God to to be the parent of those kids or that kid, and, and, and you were called to do it when they were itty bitty and, and you didn't they didn't talk back to you. Come on, somebody, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and you're called with the same calling to be their mom and dad when they start to run smack and challenge everything that you've said as though a, a, like a stack of bricks just fell on your head and you lost all your senses. Is it just me? Is she here today? Good. I'm not making fun of her into her face, right? You, you've got a constant calling to be their parent. And the same God who gave you the energy somehow to change diapers in the middle of the night, right? It, it, when you didn't even know what was going on, you were just going through some rote memory and your hands were just moving in ways, right? It, it, it's the same God who's going to help you figure out um, when your kids are hanging around with the wrong friends as they get older. That same God is going to give you a level of discernment if you'll ask him for it to know when the teenager that you have is headed down the wrong track. Why? Because he's given you a constant calling to be their parent and he always equips us for whatever calling he gives us. He just does. And if you're sensitive to that, because you're connected to the vine, whatever he calls you to do, he's going to equip you to do it, to be fruitful in that area. Listen, I'm called um, not only to be a parent, not only to be a husband, but to be the pastor of this church. I believe that. God had us come here and start this church. And if I pastor this church based on how I was feeling, 
or, or based on who wanted me to do this or, or who wanted me to do that. I wouldn't be able to sustain the fire and the passion to do this the way God has called me to do. And so I have to say no to good things sometimes. And sometimes I make people mad. Why? Because I'm committed to doing this with the vision that God gave us, the way that God called us to do it. I have a constant calling to do what God said. It's a calling. It's a vision. And I won't back down from it. We're going to still, we're going to do it the way God says to do it. And, and here's the thing about calling. For, for calling to be consistent in your life, you have to realize that life can't be always all about you. Right? That's not popular because we, we live in a narcissistic society. And it's like a badge of honor. <laughs> I'm just narcissistic, man. Hey, everybody's like, oh, good for you. You care only about yourself. Yay. Heard you got on the radio going, oh, I'm just a narcissist. Hey, everybody loves me for it. I was like, really? They love you for that? Like making it about you and not them? Okay, whatever. This is the culture we live in. And this is why the Bible says in, in, in Colossians 1, for everything, this is from the message as well, absolutely everything above and below, visible and is, invin, invisible, got started in him and finds its purpose. Where? In him. In, in God. It all starts with God. It doesn't start with you. In the beginning was God, Right? It doesn't start with your happiness, and it doesn't start with your dreams. It doesn't start with your goals and your ambitions and your aspiration. It starts with, why did God put me here on this earth? What did he have in mind when he had me be born? There's a calling. And when you figure out that calling, life begins to flow from that calling. And life starts to make sense when you understand there is a constant calling in your life. And when you tap into that, it's a power of sustainable success. The second idea here is, is he gives us that, that this is going to come to characterize us. He's talking about character, a constant character. And I just want to ask you, as I've asked myself this week, are, are you a person of constant character? Are you, are you level when it comes to character? I mean, do, do you have any core convictions that are, are bedrock in your life? Lines you won't cross, boundaries you won't ignore, right? You don't change. This is so important in a world where character stands out either for the lack of it or for the good of it. When we claim, I'm just going to speak to those of you who would call yourself a Christ follower. Not everybody may. And some of you are still checking this out. That's totally cool. But I want to speak to the folks who are saying, yeah, I am. Um, this is why when we claim to be believers and when we claim that the gospel has changed our lives, it's important then that our lives actually reflect that. First Peter, and this is in the Bible, it's a letter written to Peter's friends, he says in chapter 2, verse 12, he says, conduct yourselves honorably. Would you say that with me? Honorably. honorably. Amongst the Gentiles, and, and, and for our purposes, it's just people who are not believers. So that in a case where maybe they're going to speak against you as those, as people who've done the wrong thing, evil things, they may, by observing your good works, glorify God in the day that he comes visiting them. Meaning, they came to say something bad and they observed your life, your good works. And then God said, came to visit them and they're like, hey, because of what we saw in you, I'm going to listen to what God's saying in my life. This is what this means. That, that people are making mental notes on you and I. That's not comfortable, right? I want them to ignore me unless I'm doing good stuff. But people are watching us whether we like it or not, especially if we claim to be a believer. And what do they watch? What are they looking for? They're, they're, they're watching to see if our behavior matches our belief. They're watching to see if our talk matches our, our, our walk, if, if our character matches our, our confession. If what we claim to believe on Sunday, we're actually living out on Monday. They want to see, are these people people of integrity? And they've seen so many people who are not that... Oftentimes, they don't like Christianity. They don't like the Bible because they say, all I've ever seen of it is people who don't really live what they say. You know, integrity is a high standard of living based on a personal code of morality that does not succumb to the whim of a moment or the dictates of a majority. Integrity stands strong. There are foundational things that I believe that I don't care what so-and-so celebrity says. I don't care 
who boycotts this or who raises their voice against that. I don't care what the media outlets say. There are some things that I believe that are true based on the word of God that I will not change just because the tide of culture shifts and I'm going to stand out in a, in a bad way because I'm standing strong. Not as a jerk, not as an idiot, not in a condemning judgmental way, but this is just what I believe. And this is how I'm going to stand and live my life. That's integrity. And integrity matters. It is to personal character what, what health is to the body or 2020 vision is to the eyes. Integrity comes from the word, I don't know how to say this, integer, integer, somebody? Jer? Jer? All right. Sometimes you see a word and you go, I know I've seen this word before, but I just typed it. But what is it actually? How do I say this word? Is it just me? Okay, anyways. But, but it means a whole, it's a like whole number. It's not fraction. It's not able to be split up, right? A person of integrity is a person who is whole, not, not perfect, not mistake-free, but it's, it's a person whose lives are together. People with integrity have nothing to hide. People with integrity don't have to worry about what they said, like coming back to them, right? They have nothing to fear. This is why Solomon wrote in, in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9, he says, The ones who live with integrity live how? Securely. That there's a security that comes from knowing my life matches the thing that I say. I am who I say I am. I'll do what I say I'm going to do. Right? That, that there is a security to be found in a person who has good character. You found this. We're naturally drawn to people in life who are dependable, who, who can count on them, who, who say to a watching world, hey, but not in an arrogant or cocky way, look at me, man. I'm, this is, I am who I say I am. And are our lives built on a constant that stands out in a world where everything changes so fast? When I think of, of character, I think of core convictions. Think, things like honor, right? Again, not, not to down our culture, but honor is not valued anymore. Everybody, everybody speaks bad about everybody. It's just like normal. Dear God, don't ever read the comments after an article on the internet. There's so many trolls out there just bashing people for whatever they say. Is it just me that reads these sometimes? <laughs> Don't read them. It's terrible, man. Terrible. This is just like it's like it's 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 honorable to dishonor people, and that's not a, a thing. I, I want to treat people with honor because I hope to be treated likewise. I, I think of the word generous as a core conviction that my wife and I have. We want to be generous people, like like. And, and the way that this plays out for me is, is in a lot of ways, but one of the ways, and this isn't to pat me on the back, but when I walk into a restaurant, I want to be determined, I'm determined to be the best tipper that my waiter or wait person is going to have that day. Not if I'm going up against 500 people like for a conference, all right? Well, we, you know what I'm saying, but like one-on-one, -on -one, I, I intend for them to go, wow, that was pretty generous. Good service or bad, it's irrelevant to me. Like my bottom line is I'm coming at least at 20%. That's just me, minimum. That's what I'm going to do because I want to be a generous person. I want to make that person's day, in fact. And, and as a result, our church, one of our core values is generosity. We're going to be generous. We're going to rely on the generosity of folks who say, yeah, this is my home and I'm going to support it financially. And then we're going to take that and we're going to give away a large portion of it to people who are in need and organizations <laughs> who are doing God kind of work all around the city and around the globe. We're just going to always do that. We're going to be a generous church. What, what are your core convictions? What, what are your constants? Is your life driven by convenience or convictions? Because conviction sometimes is uncomfortable. Convictions mean sometimes people aren't going to like your convictions, but you believe them so firmly that you're going to stand strong on them always. You know, for me, one of my constants is that Church attendance has always been a priority. And I know that some of you are going, well, of course, you're the pastor. You have to come, right? <laughs> but listen, I haven't always been a pastor. But I grew up in a home where, what it, come hell or high water, we're going to church, right? This is just, like, I don't care if your arm's dangling by a thread from a lawnmower accident. Danny, get up. Drag it with you. We're going to church. My brother's here today. He'll tell you this is what we did, man. You just didn't, you're sick. All right, well, we'll go take you to get prayed for yeah, but I'm going to get them sick. Well, that's their problem. They shouldn't be praying for you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying whatever, right? Probably I, I never had my arm dangling by a thread, just FYI. But anyways, right? we just went to church. It's just what we did. And so that's been who we've been all of our lives. This is what 
we do, right? And, and there are a lot of reasons why this is true for us, right? But, but one of the reasons for me is that our culture is pervasive. The teachings, the ideas, it's pervasive. And, and there are so many opportunities as a result for my kids to learn things that I wish they didn't learn, right? So I've decided that missing church is not an option because I want my kids to come to a place where they hear that Jesus loves them and that he died for them and that he has a plan for their lives and that they are valuable to him. And they're also valuable to the people who right now are up there teaching them about Jesus. Like in a world that doesn't teach these things, I'm bringing them to a place to re that reminds them that they are loved and they are valued and they are prized and they are blessed. And I want to set them up for success by making sure that they don't miss church. Not in a legalistic way, but just in a life-giving way. They need constants in life. And for my family, this is one of them. We're coming. We're going to be here week in, week out. Another reason we do this is because we want to be around people who are headed our way. This is why we push life groups so hard. Why we're going to be pushing it hard next week. I need people in my life who I know are watching my back, who are praying for me, who are going to help me walk this out. Constant, constant counsel, right, is the next one. And, and we get our counsel usually from our connections. We get wise counsel from godly connections. So I want to use the word connections here, constant connections. You know, everybody in life needs some constant connections. People in your life that are, as you journey through life, are there beside you, walking with you. When you go through tough times, when you go through fun times, they're celebrating with you. When you're down, they help pick you up. You just, everybody needs this. And again, I don't know of a better way to get this done than through, through life groups. And we have all sorts of groups that are about to launch and marriage groups and Bible study groups and interest-based groups. And I'm going to do a leadership group for those who are saying, you know what, I could use, I, could, I want to be a better leader at, at my job or, or in the community or in my, in my church or with my family. I just want to learn that. And we're, we're just going to be doing these things uh, and they're going to start in a couple of weeks. And we're going to give you an opportunity to join these groups over the next few weeks because you and I, we know this. Life change happens best. We say this in circles and in, in groups better than it does in rows as we are right now. Here's a truth I want you to grab. You have to follow Jesus for yourself. But man, it's so difficult to do that by yourself. Amen, somebody? At, at least in an effective way. And here's another truth. Your spiritual success is highly dependent upon your support system. So what and who you're connected to, it matters. People's attitudes, the vibe that people give off, they, they affect us whether we like it or not. They rub off on us whether we like it or not. So I want to be, I want to be with people who help insulate me from life circumstances, the ups, the highs, the lows, that just are there with me to help me not to get too high, not to get too low, to remind me of the fact that God loves me, that God is for me, that God is with me. Even when I fail, he picks me up, he, he sets me on the right path. And again, nowhere do I find this more accessible than doing life with other people in, in groups. Like some of us are going, you know what, Danny, I, I need a word from God. I need God to tell me what to do. And I think that God would say to you and I, most of the time, he's going to speak to us through somebody else. Right? He's going to give us wise counsel through somebody else. And I, I want you to know that one of the, the secrets to sustainable success in life is having a network of people who know you, who care about you, who will speak truth into your life, both in, in, in positive ways and affirming ways, but also in corrective ways. Everybody needs this. And God will often speak to you through the wise words of somebody else. For me, I have, I have several relationships like that. But my wife, Rachel, is... One of my constant connections, meaning she's a constant in my life. And by the way, today is our 18th anniversary. Yes, baby, I love you. I told you I come to church no matter what. Like I want to be a PF Chang's right now, but I'm here with you people instead. She's a constant, and and, and, and that means a fixed value that doesn't change. I wouldn't make it in my life without her. She's an encourager to me. She speaks life to me. She corrects me when I'm wrong or when I'm thinking, when my thinking's not straight. And this happens, and I, I, I've given her permission to speak into my life. And, and let me just speak to all the wives here um, for a minute. Um, you, you have tremendous power, whether you realize this or not, to pull 
um, amazing things out of your man just by being a constant source of encouragement for him, right? You can make him believe that he's more talented than he is, right? Just don't send him to American Idol auditions if you can. <laughs> you, you can make him think that he's stronger than he is, that he's more powerful than he is, that he's just better. You, you can call um, for the best in him, and he will rise to it and go higher than he ever would on his own, right? Because of you being a constant source of encouragement in his life. And the converse is true. The reverse is true. Fellas, you can do the same thing for your wives. You can call for the best in her by being an encourager. Constant calling. Constant character. Constant connections. These are keys to lasting success. Here's the bad news, right? And I'm almost done. The bad news is you can't actually do any of them. Right? Why did you just tell us all that? We could have already been at Chang's right now. You guys all fired up at <laughs> Chang's. Spicy chicken, you know. Um, dear God, I can't. Can we go there after this, babe? <laughs> so hungry right now. I've been eating grass and seeds for 21 days. Just want some... No, not really grass, but you know what I'm saying. It feels like grass after a while. Really, I gotta eat another green thing? Yeah. Green is good, children. Eat them. <laughs> Jesus says, apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Yeah, you actually can't get this done apart from him. And you might not get it right even with him connected. Let me explain this in a minute. You, you ever you ever seen that two people can be at the same event and recount it completely in different ways? Like they remember the part, a different part than another person remembers. You're like, what? No, that didn't even happen. Yeah, yeah, it did. No, no, this happened. You ever done this with your spouse and you like had a like a total fight and you didn't talk to each other for three days over this? <laughs> don't, don't do that. It's not good. Better together. Come two weeks from now. We're going to teach you how to be better together. Anyway, <laughs> This happens even in the Gospels. So we know what John recorded that, that last night before Jesus was betrayed because we've been studying it for the last month. Remain in me. Abide in my love. And, he, and, he's, and he's telling them. But, but Matthew, one of the other Gospel writers, records this same night in a completely different way. Not saying he's conflicting with what John said. He just remembers a different part than John remembers. Look, look what Matthew recalls. Verse 26. When they had sung a hymn... They went out. This is, in the last, this is the last supper. They went out to the Mount of Olives. Same place. Same story. And then Jesus told them. This is what Matthew recalls Jesus saying. And Jesus says this, but he also said what John says. This very night, you will all fall away on account of me. Jesus just said, hey guys, remain in me. Hang out with me. Fix your eyes on me. Stay connected to me. You're all going to fall away. Well, which one is it? It's both. It's both. And that we don't know the order in which this is written. We don't know which one Jesus said first. We don't get to know that. But he says both of these things on the same night. Matthew recalls this part because Matthew's a tax collector. He's concerned about debt. He, he has a negative spell on everything, right? Not, not really. But he's looking at it from what's the worst thing Jesus said. John is a grace guy. John, John says, hey, I'm the guy that Jesus loved. He's looking at it through the lens of grace. And he's like, Jesus said, hey, hang out with me. Abide in my love. This is the two perspectives. Same story, two different perspectives. Matthew remembers everybody's going to run away. John remembers that Jesus said to the disciples, I want you to remain in me. And I don't know which one he said first. But what I know is Peter says at the end of it, hey, I don't care if all, everybody forsakes you. Not me. I will never forsake you. Right? And Jesus is like, yeah, you will. No, I won't. Yeah, yeah you will. For the... For the rooster crows three times, you will. And it's true. It's exactly what happens. You fall. The, all, all of them ran. All of them scattered. Every single one of them ran for their lives when pressure got applied to their lives. They had a calling. They had been in council with Jesus for three and a half years. They were, they were developing the character that he wanted. But when the pressure came, they all ran. Even Peter. The rock. Right? And, and, and Jesus is like, it's, it's all right that all of you are going to run away because the constant in your life isn't going to be your love for me. The constant in your life is going to be my love for you. It's never going to change. It's never going to waver. It's never going to fall. The highs, the lows, the good, the bad, the ugly in your life. When you think, man, I want to do well and you do the wrong thing. When you choose, you think I'm going to live right, I'm going to finally get this right, but you end up going down the wrong path. The one thing that remains is going to be my love for you. And, if, and, and he never says, I want you to manage your love for me. He never says that. He says, I want you to abide in my love for you. And from my love for you, that, that's going to be the source 
of your calling and the source of your character and the source of your connections. And he says to every one of us, you're gonna, you're gonna have seasons in your life, moments where you lose sight of calling and you lose sight of character and you lose sight of your connections. And you think I, can think, I can handle this on my own, I've got this. But I want you to remember through it all, it's not dependent on you. It's dependent on my love for you. So I'm gonna pray for you, we're done. I want you to stand with me real quick. The, the secret of lasting success is to remember that it's not what you've done for him. It's what he's done for you. It's tethering yourself, anchoring yourself in the fact that through good or bad, through ugly and sad times, good times, I am anchored in the love of Christ. Amen, somebody? Can I pray for you real quick? Would you bow your heads and would you close your eyes? The band's coming. I'm going to lead you out here in just a second. So, Lord, we come to you right now, God. We've been in this series, The Power of Same. And I, I pray that after four weeks of this, that we, we all have some things in our life that we're, that we're starting to do on a recurring basis. Or, or, or maybe if we haven't taken the time, we, we start to think through, what are the things? What are the things that I need to be anchored to? What are the things that I need to be doing, c connecting my life to so that my life will bear fruit? Because at the end of the day, God, we all, whether we've ever thought about it in these terms, we all want to be successful. We all want our lives to matter. We all want to, we all want to have healthy marriages and healthy relationships. and We all want to do, do good things. We want to do things that matter. We all want this. And this is also what you want from us. And you told your followers, and I think you're speaking to us just as well, that if we'll do the power of saying, we'll just be connected to you over a long period of time, day in and day out. We won't always get it right. But that it's not dependent on our, our commitment or our level of love for you. It's, it's, all of this is dependent on your love for you, uh, for us, rather. I thank you for that, God. I pray that your word would find good soil in our hearts and lives and would go and bear much fruit. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Sing this with me. You love never fails, never gives up, and never runs out on me.